Good afternoon and welcome as we celebrate the 29th Sunday and Ordinary Time. We also welcome the members of the class of 1971 from Vincentian Institute who are celebrating their 50th anniversary reunion this weekend. And we welcome the people who are praying with us at home. Um, the song for preparation of the gifts is in a worship aid that you should have picked up on your way in. If you did not, they're on the table at both entrances. You might want to grab one. Then if you would please stand and join us as we sing number 690 in the green gather book under your chairs. we gather in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Spirit be with you all. Amen. On this 29th Sunday of the church year, Jesus is making his way to Jerusalem, obviously, as he has been for the past two months. <laughs> and he's almost there and talking about discipleship and the cost of discipleship. And then James and John come up to him and say, uh, we want to, uh, can you give us this special favor? We want to be at your left and right when you enter the kingdom. They just are so dense. <laughs> they don't get the 
message that Jesus has been trying to teach the past two months about service as being primary. First reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah has an expression of that suffering servant image that early Christians picked up on as an example, as a prefiguring of who Christ was and what his message was. In the second reading, letter to the Hebrews, written to a Christian community that's growing lax, reminds the folks that Christ has entered the heavenly court and will be their advocate. And he can identify with the people because he shared the life of a human person. So it's a time to uh, acknowledge that to be a faithful follower, there's no uh, easy way to do this, but rather one that authentically demands a commitment, which sometimes causes pain and suffering. And so we pray, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. And may Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sin, bring us to everlasting life. Almighty, ever-living God, grant that we may always conform our will to yours and serve you in sincerity of heart. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever.
A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The Lord was pleased to crush him in his infirmity. He gives his life as an offering for sin. He shall see his descendants in a long life and the will of the Lord shall be accomplished through him. Because of his infliction, he shall see the light and fullness of days. Through his suffering, my servant shall justify many, and their guilt shall be bare. The word of the Lord.
A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has similarly been tested in every way, yet without sin. So let us confidently approach the throne of Christ, of grace, to receive mercy and to find grace for timely help. The word of the Lord. According to Mark. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he replied, What do you wish me to do for you? They answered him, Grant that in your glory, we may sit, one at your right and the other at your left. <laughs> Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Can you drink the cup that I drink? Or be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, We can. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right or at my left is not mine to give. It's for those for whom it's been prepared. Now when the other ten heard this, <clears throat> they became indignant at James and John. And Jesus summoned them, and he said to them, You know, those who are recognized as rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones make their authority over them felt it shall not be so among you rather whoever wishes to be great among you will be your servant whoever wishes to be first among you will be the slave of all for the son of man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The Gospel of the Lord. <clears throat> hmm. 
I remember over 50 years ago when I was in the seminary down in Baltimore, when we had this gospel, one of the faculty members got up for the homily and said, this is the story of how James and John wanted to be the first two Monsignors. <laughs> they were looking for the glory. The seats of privilege and status. And they just didn't understand that they should set aside their personal ambition if they wanted to be a faithful follower of Jesus. And I think <clears throat> they started the they were the beginning of a great tradition in the Roman Catholic Church. <laughs> Clergy people who like to lord it over. They like to be in charge. They like to have their authority felt. And it's not only a Catholic church, it's probably any organized religion. Where people have this understanding, as false as it is, that people in charge should be in charge. <laughs> and Jesus says people in charge should be servants and surrender to the needs of their congregation, their people. The problem is, people don't always understand the significance of what Jesus is trying to get across. And he's talking about having to surrender, how to be a service to somebody else, going to have to be a follower, you have to endure sufferings. And even there, sometimes religious people go to the opposite extreme. It's almost as if, I know, some people who, their spirituality is such that if it's not painful, it's not good for you. <laughs> you know? <clears throat> and the more pain you have, the holier you are. <laughs> and that's crazy. That doesn't make sense. And yet, Jesus is uh, trying to get you to be realistic. That if you're going to be a faithful follower, you need to be willing to uh, get out of your comfort zone and to identify with compassion people who are in need. Compassion is a word that means to suffer with. It's not suffering for the sake of suffering. It's suffering as collateral damage <laughs> for being a faithful follower. And it's something that has gotten messed up in our religious traditions in many, many places. <clears throat> I had an aunt, God bless her, Irish-American woman, was religious, but she loved bad news. <laughs> and the worse the news was, the more she liked to share it and learn about it and carry on with it. It's all that, you know, <sighs> craziness. Because when you take religion too seriously like that, you lose touch with reality. It's not God's intention that we all suffer. It's God's intention that we all be faithful and we be open to reaching out to those who are in need. And if you're going to be compassionate, <clears throat> there is going to be some collateral damage. <laughs> you're going to have to uh, experience the pain that some people have that you're there to help mitigate and to serve. Someone has said to me recently, <clears throat> you know, all this talk about abortion. And people talk about it as if they forget the people that are involved. What drives a person to seek an abortion? It's not their first choice. If anything, it's a desperate attempt to deal with an unbearable situation. And sometimes... People talk about it as if, you know, 
It's somehow an easy way out, <laughs> or a appropriate form of birth control. <laughs> obviously, it's not. But obviously, there are people who suffer. There are teenagers who get pregnant and don't know where to go. There are people who have congenital issues and pregnancy can threaten their lives. And those are hard experiences. When you want to walk with people as they go through those situations, it's going to be painful for you too. Because you're going to be identifying with the struggles, the suffering of people who have a sense of loss and confusion and don't know where to go. And it's easy to say, well, let's make the laws. It's more difficult to let's make the facilities <laughs> for people who are in those situations. It's easy to say it's against the law. It takes more effort to be present to people in those situations. I remember many years ago, <clears throat> a young couple that I knew, I'd seen them grow up and through high school and whatever. And I kind of lost touch, but <clears throat> the, the fellow came to see me one time. <clears throat> and he said, uh, haven't, you know, I said, uh, how's your girlfriend doing? Because <laughs> I knew they were planning marriage. He says, well, it's, it's not going to happen. I said, what happened? He said, well, we got pregnant. And we panicked. And we got an abortion. And it's the worst thing that happened to us. We are no longer together. And if that's the, the man's experience, imagine what the woman's experience is, you know? I have no easy solutions for these dilemmas that we find in our society. But I do know that if you're going to get involved, you're going to feel pain. You're going to be suffering. And that's the kind of suffering that Jesus is talking about today. It's the suffering that's based on fidelity. It's a, it's a suffering that happens when you identify with people in need and can feel their pain. It becomes your pain as well. And that's the suffering that is redemptive and therapeutic as opposed to having suffering for the sake of having suffering. I knew a fellow who used to say the rosary with his arms outstretched. And he felt that was, make, that was holier than just saying the rosary, because <laughs> it was painful. <laughs> I don't think that makes any sense. <laughs> what makes sense is that sometimes you have to suffer if you're going to be compassionate. If you're going to walk with people in their journey, when they are in need, and there's no simple solutions. So, James and John didn't get it. And I don't think a lot of people do get it. Religion becomes either cheap grace, Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, the famous German Lutheran pastor in World War II, who got in trouble fighting the Nazis, and he talked about cheap graces when you have baptism without commitment, when you have forgiveness without repentance, if you have communion without consecrating your life, be a faithful follower. That's cheap grace. Genuine grace obviously comes when you pay the price of being a faithful follower of Jesus. So it's not for us to judge anybody else. It's only for us to be honest with ourselves. And as we struggle with the issues that are on our, our <clears throat> agenda these days, let's uh, be a little less distant, a little less judgmental, 
a little less sanitized and be willing to deal with the issues that might cause you some discomfort, that might cause you some suffering, that might bring about some pain in your life. Because that's the pain that Jesus had in mind when he said, you want to be a follower, you got to be willing to take up your cross. It's not the cross for the sake of the cross itself. It's the cross, that's the price of being faithful. And because Jesus was faithful, he went through the cross to new life. And he wants us to make that same journey. Let us profess our faith together. I believe in God, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Prompted by the Spirit of God, we place our intentions before the altar. That all Christians may be willing to sacrifice their comfort to ease the suffering of people around them, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That the synodal process initiated this week by Pope Francis may lead us ever deeper into the communion of the Church, foster our participation in it, and equip us to go out in mission. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That national and local leaders may accept their roles as servants of the people they govern. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That members of our parish may compassionately lift burdens off of struggling families and homeless people in our community. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That people who feel imprisoned by guilt for their weaknesses may be set free by mercy, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That the sick may be healed by humble and compassionate medical professionals, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That Eileen Keene, John Keene, the deceased members of the class of Vincentian Institute 1971, and all who have died, may be welcomed at the throne of grace, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That God may answer the prayers in our book of intentions and those we hold in our hearts. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Spirit of the living God dwelling within us, soften our hearts. Help us to be more compassionate toward those in need and not be afraid to share their pain as we walk with them in life. Make our prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. I invite you now, if you brought an offering, to place it in the baskets at the base of our altar platform.
Sisters, brothers, my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Grant us, Lord, we pray, a sincere respect for your gifts, that through the purifying action of your grace, we may be cleansed by the very mysteries we serve through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. With you. Lift up your hearts. Be Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right truly right and just our duty, our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Holy Father, Lord of heaven and earth, through Christ. For by your word, you created the world. And you govern all things. You gave us the same word made flesh as mediator. And he has spoken your words to us and called us to follow him. He is the way that leads to you, the truth that sets us free, the life that fills us with gladness. Through your son, you gather men and women whom you've made for the glory of your name into one family redeemed by the blood of his cross, signed with the seal of the Spirit. And therefore, now and for ages unending, with all the angels, we proclaim your glory as in joyful celebration we acclaim. Holy, holy, Lord God of hope, heaven and Yes. 
blessed is he comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. You are indeed holy and to be glorified, O God, who love the human race who always walk with us on the journey of life. Blessed indeed is your Son, present in our midst, when we are gathered by his love, and when, as once for the disciples, so now for us, he opens the scriptures and breaks the bread. And therefore, Father most merciful, we ask you to send forth your Holy Spirit to sanctify these gifts of bread and wine, that may become for us the body and blood of our Lord. Jesus Christ. For on the day before he was to suffer, and the night of the Last Supper, he took bread and said the blessing. He broke the bread and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it. For this is my body, which will be given up for you. Similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice. He gave you thanks and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink of it. This is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. This bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death, O Lord, until you come again. And therefore, Holy Father, as we celebrate the memorial of Christ, your Son, our Savior, whom you led through his passion and death on the cross to the glory of the resurrection, and whom you have seated at your right hand, we proclaim the work of your love until he comes again. We offer you the bread of life, the chalice of blessing. So look with favor on the offering of your church in which we show forth the paschal sacrifice of Christ that has been handed on to us. Granted by the power of the Spirit of your love, we may be counted now and until the day of eternity among the members of your Son, in whose body and blood we have communion. By our partaking of this mystery, Almighty Father, give us life through your Spirit. Grant that we may be conformed to the image of your Son and confirm us in the bond of communion together with Francis, our Pope, Edward, our Bishop, all the other bishops, the priests, the deacons, the men and women who minister in your name, and your entire people. And grant that all the faithful of the Church, looking into the signs of the times by the light of faith, may constantly devote themselves to the service of the Gospel. Keep us attentive to the needs of all, that sharing their grief and their pain, their joy and hope, we may faithfully bring them the good news of salvation and go forward with them along the way of your kingdom. Remember our brothers and sisters who've fallen asleep in the peace of your Christ and all the dead whose faith you alone have known. Admit them to rejoice in the light of your face. In the resurrection, give them the fullness of life. Grant also to us when our earthly pilgrimage is done, we may come to an eternal dwelling place and live with you forever. There, in communion with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, Joseph, her spouse, the apostles, the martyrs, Vincent, the Paul, and all the saints, we shall praise and exalt you <clears throat> through Jesus Christ, your Son. Through him and with him and in him, <clears throat> O God, Almighty Father, 
in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All glory and honor is yours forever and ever. At the Savior's command, formed by divine teaching, we dare to pray together. Our Father, hallowed be thy name. Kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil, and graciously grant peace in our days. That by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin, safe from all distress. As we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, and my peace I give you. But not in our sins, but on the faith of your church, graciously grant us peace and unity in accordance with your will, who will live and reign forever and ever. Amen. Peace of the Lord be with you always. And we offer each other a sign of the Lord's peace. takes away the sin of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. Only say the word, my soul shall be healed.
Let us pray. <clears throat> Grant, O oh Lord, we pray that benefiting from participation in this sacrament, we may be helped by what you give in this present age and prepared for the gifts that are eternal through Christ our Lord. Amen. I'm going to forego the announcements this afternoon because Colleen Thapalia is going to be offering our annual stewardship report. Good evening, good evening everybody. The last few years, uh, Father Ferrano would tell me, good job, whenever I gave these reports. Then he would hold up his finger in that gesture that we know so well and add, it was short. So I will try to honor his memory with brief remarks. Let me start by saying that our parish remains on strong financial footing. At the same time, we have not been spared the complexities of 2020 and 2021. The handouts, visual aid, the handouts, um, at the entrances go into detail, so I'll just highlight a few things. Like last year, our offertory was lower than the previous year, but this was offset by donations to the food pantry. In the past, the giving tree was not reflected in financial statements as we gave actual wrapped gifts, presents, but this past Christmas we gave gift cards so the giving tree is accounted for. Other campaigns like Undie Sunday this weekend are not in the bookkeeping, but are an important part of our stewardship. Our $50,000 PPP loan was converted to a grant as anticipated, as we met all conditions of the grant. It's encouraging that we did not qualify for the second round because our finances were stable and we did not meet the criteria for need. As promised, we set up an investment account to ensure the sustainability of the parish. The fund is managed carefully to comply with Catholic teaching. So far, it has provided us with $85,000 in unrealized gains, and at present, we do not need to tap into those funds for operational expenses. We've also set aside a portion of the income from the Reigniting Our Faith Capital Campaign to establish the Louise de Marillac Fund. It provides seed money for innovative parish projects, including our seasonal art program and the electric vehicle station. Information on how to apply for this grant will be available later this month. The parish has also seen more people approaching us informally for charitable donations and individual help. So there is an increase in need in the community. Unfortunately, I must also share that there have been three Child Victim Act claims that made that affect our parish. These are not resolved yet, so there's nothing more I can add, but the diocese is handling the legal process for these. Finally, the parish owns a parking lot at 966 Madison Avenue, which is that way, a portion of which has been leased to the College of St. Rose for many years. It has been treated consistently by the city as tax exempt. However, the city has now removed ex its exempt status and assessed property taxes, which exceed the rental revenue received by the parish. <laughs> Following informal, unsuccessful efforts to res resolve its status and the associated tax burden, the parish was compelled uh, hold on, I lost my spot. I was compelled to initiate an action for court intervention. The action, which involves issues of notice, use, and finances, is in its preliminary stages. No decision has been made by the court. We will keep you informed about this. Obviously, a lot happened in the last fiscal year. It truly was a year like no other. Fortunately, our parish has the wonderful leadership of Elizabeth Simcoe and our bookkeeper, Veronica Schmidt-Hensler. We also benefit from the knowledge and wisdom of my fellow Stewardship Council members, Diana Banger-Drowns, Katrina Concilio, and, I'm sorry, Paul Larrabee and Al Churro. Before I close, here's a personal opinion. The largest part of our parish revenue comes from all of you, week in and week out, whether you donate here or online. These funds give us the flexibility to steer our own path with liturgy and programs that we designed for ourselves. 
This is a tremendous freedom, which I encourage you all to reflect on when deciding your level of giving to St. Vincent's. To wrap up and keep my promise to be brief, this year and always, we ask for your continued generosity and especially for your prayers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kelly. I'm very grateful for your leadership on our stewardship council. Uh, both Colleen and I are available after Mass to answer questions, if anyone has any. And um, also, let us acknowledge, are there any birthdays or anniversaries or other significant events? Your Mary Agnes' birthday. Happy birthday. Uh, anyone else? May you enjoy a blessed week and happy reunion, VI. <coughs> Lord be with you. And may Almighty God bless us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life.